University Beautiful Campus. The colleges of nuclear science, life science, and the technology management are proud to present today's lecture to be given by our honorable guest, Dr. Eva Geiber, a Nobel laureate in physics. Now, may I introduce to you the host of today's event, Dr. Hong Yifu from Biomedical Engineering and the Environmental Science Department. We are welcome, Dr. Hong. Good morning, uh, honorable guest, uh, Dr. Eva Gaver, uh, Mrs. Gaver, our uh, university president Chen, and uh, vice president Zhang, and uh, Dean uh, Xi, and also uh, our friends from the Delta Group. And also, I noticed that we have also an honorable guest. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Hu, uh, let's have a warm welcome uh, for our uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm very delighted uh, this morning uh, to have this opportunity to welcome all of you to attend this uh, special presentation by Dr. Gaber. And before the presentation, I would like to invite our university president, Chen, to give an opening address uh, to uh, welcome our honorable guests and the ever, please. Uh, Professor Geiger, uh, Mrs. Geiger, uh, distinguished uh, guests, and uh, all our colleagues and students at Tsinghua, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure, I, indeed my honor, to have this opportunity representing National Tsinghua University to extend a formal and warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, 1973 Nobel laureate in physics, Professor Geiger. Professor Geiger is a scholar who is not easy to introduce within the time that I am allowed in this podium. He has accomplished so much, recognized and respect by so many. So I'm not going to go over his long list of honors and accomplishments here. Instead, I will take this, this opportunity to highlight basic of Professor Guyver's career that most people knew but rarely dwell upon. This is the versatility that he has personalized. Born and grew up in Norway, he immigrated to Canada in 1954 and then to the United States in 1956. Yes, many of us who has had the experience of studying abroad knew well, migrating and adapting to a new environment where the language and culture are different, but those are the ones on, it's not an easy task. But uh, Professor Geiger did it, and did it well. He made the best use of the educational and the provisional opportunity that his host countries had to offer and excite in his fields, he decided to concentrate on. It takes a versatile man to adapt and to adapt well. As an undergraduate, Professor Geiger was trained in the field of mechanical engineering, but his PhD were in theoretical physics. In 1970, six years after receiving his doctoral degree, he expanded into biophysics as a Guggenheim Fellow at Cambridge and England. Also mechanical engineering, theoretical physics, and biophysics are somewhat related. It takes a versatile scholar to integrate what he has learned from these disciplines. 
um, children are a unique cause for his own professional voyage. What a successful scholarly voyage Professor Geiger has sailed. Today, we are very fortunate and the National Tsinghua University are very honored that Professor Geiger is going to share some of his findings that he has gathered in his voyage of discovery. I'm sure that his lecture uh, this morning and as well as this afternoon will be enlightening and we will learn a great deal from his uh, presentations. Why I urge you to learn from what is going to say. I would also like you to study Professor Geiger's uh, career path because I believe this research experience exemplifies the pathway to an outstanding scholarship. I could go on to tell you more about our distinguished uh, speaker, but I guess you probably would prefer to hear him directly. So, Without further delay, may I present to you Professor Yuan Gai. In addition to our president's uh, uh, introductions about uh, Dr. Gaber, I also noticed that uh, in his uh, webpage, uh, he likes to ski in the winter in Utah and also uh, likes to uh, sailing in uh, Norway in the summer. And uh, not only this, uh, I also found out this morning that uh, my daughter uh, works in uh, GE Research Centers in Miss uh, Kaluna and also lives nearby uh, uh, Professor Gaver and Mrs. Gaver's <laughs> residence, very close. So I'm honestly very uh, honored by this uh, coincidence. And, uh, uh, let's have a warm welcome uh, for Dr. Gaber's uh, speech this morning. And the speech uh, subject has been changed, and the topic is a uh, biosensor using whole cell. So let's have a warm welcome for Dr. Gaber. I, I'd like to uh, thank you for the invitation to come here, and uh, it's my delight, my wife's delight to be able to visit Taiwan. And I'm very delightful also to meet. I have been the second graduate student I have in physics. It's Sean Min Lo, I found out, was a graduate of this university. And I met this professor as well this morning, so that was very nice. And he was a very nice student. And uh, what, what I want to talk about today, a biocentric called ease, is actually Sean Min Lo was a great help to developing this technique. So then you can, for the students here, you can then find out what will happen to you if you go to the United States for a graduate degree, or what might happen to you. So the question is, what kind of research do I do? And the, I'll show you this picture here. <laughs> and uh, so the kind of research I do is shown here. I was, here, I'm coming from, as you heard, I was a mechanical engineer, and I changed into physics and now I work in biology. And all was amazing to me to learn that all animals are built up of cells, just like a building is built up of bricks. So like an elephant, for example, or a flower, or you are built up of cells. And so that's the building block. The other thing which I never get tired of being amazed by is that we are alive. But the cell who makes you up are also alive. So you are really a collection of living cells. If you're a biologist, I don't know what your backgrounds are here, but if you're a biologist, of course, you know that well. But if you're a physicist, you don't really think about that too often. And to me, that's an amazing thing. Now, the reason we know that you consist of cells is that we can grow those in the laboratory. And this is the way you do tissue culture, which is shown here. And you start off with a little piece of meat. You put it in a plastic dish. The dishes are this size. And you put in the plastic dish a liquid, which is contain all the things you like to think the cells like to eat. 
And then, if you're lucky, the cells come crawling out of the there, right? So the cells come crawling out of the of the piece of meat, and here they crawl on the surface. And so the cell move and crawl, and they're alive, which is the interesting thing. And in my lab in the United States, I very often work with undergraduate students before they take and they're starting their PhD program. And I told them, I told one a few years ago, maybe 15 years ago or so, that uh, when you do this little piece of meat, it has to be very fresh. You can't buy it in the supermarket. <laughs> it has to be a fresh piece of meat. And uh, what biologists do, they kill them. Obviously, actually, the biologists never kill anything. They sacrifice things. <laughs> and, and they start the tissue culture. So I told him that, and then the student I had at that time, two weeks later, he came into the lab, and he had a bandage on his arm. And you guessed it, he had cut out a little piece of meat from his arm, and started his own tissue culture. And those are the kind of bread or dedicated students I like to have. <laughs> and interestingly enough, we still have those cells in the lab. And uh, the, because you can, you can grow these cells up and you can freeze them. You can freeze them to, a to uh, what we call liquid nitrogen temperature and then these cells will last forever. And then you can tore them back up and you can use them. So we still have these cells. So that's an interesting thing. Actually, the other interesting thing is that you can freeze cells, but you can't freeze living organisms. You can't freeze a fly, for example, it would die. In the United States, some rich people in the United States, they actually, when they die, they freeze themselves down in liquid nitrogen temperature. And I hope that 300 years from now, some scientists will figure out what they died from and revive them and cure them. I think that's a very optimistic point of view. <laughs> And uh, if you aren't that rich, you can actually freeze your head down instead. <laughs> That's much cheaper, but it would be more tougher to wake you up later. <laughs> so when you study cells, you in tissue culture, you use special microscopes. It's not like a metallurgical microscope that physicists tend to use. It's a microscope where the light comes from the bottom. And what you see in these microscopes is Cells. So if you look at this thing here, if you're not used to looking at cell, this is a single cell here, for these cells are normal. And the cells on the top are cancer cells. So you see the cancer cells grow different from normal cells. When you look at the cells, you can recognize that they look different. And when I went into biology, I was shocked by the getting to know that if you get cancer, what people do, they look at the cells. The medical doctor takes a biopsy, which means he takes a little piece of meat, and he looks at it under the microscope. And if the cells look orderly, he says, you're lucky you don't have cancer. But if the cells look randomly, he says, unfortunately, you have cancer, we have to operate. Now you recognize, that this is a subjective decision. There's no science in that whatsoever. And I thought that maybe we could go in and, and finding out how you can actually identify cancer cells absolutely. We haven't been able to do that, but that's the reason why I got interested in this field to begin with, is that when you get diagnosed for cancer, there's really no way of accurately doing it. And if you know somebody who has miraculously been cured for cancer, in my opinion, that person was misdiagnosed. Because you cannot diagnose it correctly. So this is a problem. I want to talk to you about Mises electrical cell substrate impedance sensing. And I forgot to tell you when you were in the first slide when I listed where I came from. I work as a professor at RPI, but I also am the chairman of the company called Applied Biophysics. So when I now talk to you, you have to look at me sometimes as a professor and sometimes as a salesman. <laughs> I hope you can sell you on this instrument, which Shun Min Lo, my student and a student from here, helped.
to develop. So we used electrical field to study cells rather than looking at them in the microscope. And so we have then a little culture dish, and on the bottom of the dish we have evaporated electrodes. And when the cells move onto these electrodes, they block the current. So if you look at the top, we apply an AC current between these two electrodes. If you get cells on one electrode, the current can flow as easily. And they can detect that then on the computer screen, that the resistance will increase. So it's a very simple experiment. And here is a typical result of the thing. Here we seed the cells out at time equal to zero. They attach, they go down, attach to the surface and start spreading out, and that's why the resistance will increase, because the current from the electrode can't easily flow through the cells. And then we get all this noise on top of this curve, but that is not electrical noise. That noise comes from the fact that the cells are alive, and they crawl around on the electrode. So that's, a, that's we see then that the cells really are alive on these electrodes. And now I'm going to talk to you about electrochemistry, and tell you all I know about electrochemistry. When you have a metal, the current in a metal are carried by electrons. When you have a solution, then the current in the solution is carried by ions. And there is an interface between the metal and the solution. And that interface has a <coughs> persistence and impedance. An electron jump onto an ion, for example, that, that causes a resistance or an impedance change. And that's the impedance change we want to measure. So this is a very simple thing. That's the impedance with the surface. The problem with this, if you want to measure it, is that if you have to take two electrodes and put them into a solution, what you normally measure, if there's a centimeter or two between these two electrodes, what you normally measure is the impedance of the solution. And you're not interested in that. You're interested in measuring the impedance on the surface. So that's the reason why this experiment I'm going to talk about hasn't been done before. And so this called the Faraday resistance on the surface and the solution resistance then dominates that and you can't really see that. But there is a trick, and that was an invention which Charlie Keith and I made. And that is to make a very small electrode. If you make a small electrode, you have this, the solution resistance depends on 1 over r, 1 over the radius of the electrode, while the Faraday resistance depends on 1 over r squared. And then if you make r sufficiently small, that means that the Faraday resistance on the surface is bigger than the resistance on the solution. And so that is the trick, and that's an invention, and that's what we made then to make this little company I'm going to talk about. And so here you see the electrode they normally use. It's a 250 micron in size. This is full of resist here, which the cells grows on that. And this electrode is made of gold. And here you can see the cells on the electrode because the gold is so thin that it's transparent. And you can see the cells clearly in the microscope. This thing goes into an electrified dish, which is shown here, which goes into a holder which is shown here, which goes into them an incubator, which is shown, actually it's not shown there, but this is the system here. So this goes into an incubator, and you have it in computer, and this is the system which takes the data. And that's what I'm going to try to sell you. So when we have then the, uh, what we call ESIS, electrical cell substance impedance sensing, when we have that, then we have the cells in a small electrode, you have an AC current source, a current flows for the electrode, in through the copper electrode and have a phasive impedance sensor, which is a fancy voltmeter, and then on the voltmeter, then on the PC, it can do the measurement. And this measurement is non invasive. The cell doesn't know that the electrical current goes to the sides. And we interpret the result as resistance and a capacitor in series, but you don't have to do that, that's something we do. So here is a typical result. Here we have taken two different cell types, which are well-known cell type, NRK cells, and BC, BSC cells. And this is an electrode with no cells on it. If you have no cells on it, of course, nothing changes. If you have NRK cells on it, they will attach to the electrode and spread, and, and then the spread is complete to get fluctuations in top of the curve. 
The BSC cells will adapt, as you see, much faster, and uh, we are much more noise on top of the curve. So this is typical signatures of two different cell types. So if you're looking at one cell type and keep the case, you can recognize these cell types by looking at the signatures of the curve. But this is one thing we do. Another thing we do, we can pre-coat the electrode with different layers of absorbed protein before we do the inoculation. And so here is to be taken a little drop of protein on the electrode, and we then pre-coat it. And here is a typical example, or this is MDCK cells, where we have pre-coated the electrode for different electrodes with different proteins. Fibronectin is what biologists know is what tend to anchor cells to the surface. I use laminin with another protein, we use vitronectin, and finally bovine serum albumin. You see that the cell doesn't like to settle down on bovine serum albumin very much. It takes them 15 to 15 hours or so, while on fibronectin they settle out very, very fast. Now the reason you may wonder if you're not the biologist why people do experiments like that. And one reason is because I got support from a cancer foundation actually to do research. And one reason is that if you are unfortunate enough to get cancer, like a woman gets breast cancer, for example, you don't die from breast cancer because you don't die from lumps in your breast. But you die because, or you may die, because the breast cancer cell will spread. They will metastasize and it will move from the breast to the, in particular, the breast cancer go to the lung. For men, which tend to get prostate cancer, the prostate, you don't die from big lumps in your prostate, but you die because the prostate cancer cell metastasize and normally go to the bone marrow. And do an experiment like that, you can find out what kind of surfaces the cell would like and what they tend to settle down on. Now, I want to emphasize, if there are biologists in this room, is that what we are really measuring is not the electrical properties of the cells as such. We are measuring the property of the electrode. So when the cells settle down on the electrode, if they will spread out, and they will, since the current can't really easily flow through the cells, then, then the resistance will. So if you measure only the insulating properties of the cells, the membrane which goes around the cell doesn't easily pass current. If you put plastic pieces on the electrode, you basically see the same thing. Except that with the plastic pieces, you don't get any oscillations in the cells, in the current. So here is then the system again. This is the small electrode, and the current will flow freely. If you put cells on it, the current has much more difficult to flow. And if you look at it in detail, the current, the cells actually sit up on the electrode, and the current will flow under the cells and up between the cells. This resistance being known as the barrier function, and some actually, since we use an AC current, some current actually flow right through the cell by capacitive coupling through the cells. But most of the current flow this way. So that's why the resistance increases when you put cells on the electrode. And there's a published model, so we have, we have a theoretical model since I come from physics. Physics physicists like to calculate everything, and we can then extract from the data the barrier function, the resistance, the height of the cell here, and the membrane capacity. So we have a good model which fits the experiment. And what is measured then using EASIS, this, this, we can measure cell morphology, barrier function I talked about, relative size of cells, and spaces beneath the cell, membrane capacities. All measurements are made in a normal culture medium. We don't do anything other than what people do who actually culture cells. And the, the limitations is that the cell have to attach to the surface. If the cell does not attach, then we can't really see very much. I tried to expand this method to look at bacteria, but bacteria doesn't attach to surfaces very well. So we haven't succeeded in doing that. Now, the reason we can use this as a morphology sensor or, or a, in, a, in a biosensor is that you can give you this is a picture of a cell here, and anything you challenge the cell with, the cell will respond. If it's with a ligand binding to the receptor, the cell will change, morphology changes, means the shape, shape changes. Or you can put DNA in it, it will change the cell shape. Physical changes, like temperature changes, drugs, viruses, or whatever, 
and you change the morphology changes, if the morphology or shape changes, then the easiest impedance changes would be measured and that we can measure. So that might become a biosensor for various things. And for drug discovery, which unfortunately I could not talk about, my friend and companion Charlie Keys talk about drug discovery, then this is the using a whole cell for drug discovery is becoming more and more important in the United States. So if you add a chemical, let's see what happens to the curves. Here is the endothelial cells, which is the cell who line your blood vessels. The people who deal with that are interested in knowing how thrombin affects that. So here we first put on the sham, you see the curve doesn't change at all. Here thrombin is put on and we get a big change in resistance. And then the curve slowly slide back, climb back up again. But this is a way people can study the way how, how thrombin affects the cell layer and the very point. Another example is the septaminophen, which I think is the drug which is in Tylenol, the painkiller Tylenol. And if you start putting the septaminophen in the, in the valves before we put the drug in, then if you have 10 milligrams per ml, you see the cell cannot really attach. They don't lift. It's too much. If you have 5 milligrams per ml, the cell will put the tap and then it will die. And then you can have twofold delusions and finally you get to the control where the cell doesn't really care. So this is a measure then dilution control in this system. Now let me show what happens to a cell when you have a virus attack. This is some work I'm doing in Oslo at the present time. And I hear you use fish cells. And because fish farming is very important in Norway. And the fish farming are, are, are troubled by viruses which attack the fish and kill the fish, and that's a large economic loss. So here is we have four different electrodes. Four of them are controlled with no viruses in. Four of them have have, is, have been affected with a virus. At time equal to zero, these have been the cells have been put in with the virus, and with the control, the cells were put in with no virus. And you clearly see then that the, did you see the reproducibility of our experiments, and you see then that the cells get killed. So this is a, this is a work in progress which we're trying to get published right now. Here is a different example. Here they, they have started the cells and grown them up, and at this particular point in time, we've added the virus. And this is a tenfold dilution. So this is diluted by ten. And this is probably diluted by roughly one million. And you see then, the higher the dilution, the longer it takes before the virus attacks the cell and kills the cell. And you hear this is the control, and here you see the cell has been killed. So you can easily see this in this particular case. And then I go to short to talk about something we are very excited about now, meshing the metastatic potential using these. And the idea behind this experiment is to have endothelial cells on the surface. On top of the endothelial cells, we put cancer cells. And cancer cells, when they metastasize, has to get into the bloodstream. And to have and they get into the bloodstream, they have to penetrate the endothelial layer who, who, who go around the, the blood vessels. And so they still have to work themselves through and finally have a penetration. And if you look at this thing, you see here, this is the bottom layer, these are endothelial cells here, and these round lumps here are cancer cells on top. And you hear these, these which have been artificially colored are on the way through the cell layer. So this so people can see that they use a microscope to detect these cells. Now we do, however, we are adding the cells on top. So this is what we do. We actually now use the, what they call a dunning rat prostatic and then a carcinoma series, which are cells we get from John Hopkins in the United States. They have developed cell lines, and the cell line is the same cell, but the cell have been changed over time. And they have cell line, which is called the G line, which are non-cancerous, basically. If you inject it in a rat, nothing much happened to it. However, you have developed cell line called AK1 cell line. If you inject that in the rat, it will start metastasizing and spread. Then you have the highly metastatic cell line, which the cells that spread very fast. And so we try these cells, and the way we do it then is first grow the layer of endothelial cells, which is shown here. 
and now the layer is confluent, and now on top of this layer we apply the cancer cells, and you show them half here, and here we see the result. These are weakly and highly metastatic. So this is the control. At this particular point, we put cancer cells on top of the layer, and after a few hours, for the highly metastatic one, they really penetrate all, and after five, six hours, they are all in. And the weakly metastatic one, you know, there's a really big difference between those two. And all the, all the typical examples we have tried work very well. So we are hoping this will make the instrument clinical. And if that's the case, you're looking at the rich man. Because clinical research, you can make a lot of money. And we actually, the, our main customers are professors, so we're not really doing that well in that sense. So then I'm going to talk about another thing called electroporation. I said when you grow cells of the electrodes, the cells, this is the typical curve they get. And I said the electrical field have no effect on the cell. At this point, when I have the blue line here, we have applied the voltage pulse, which is 10 times the voltage we normally use to the cells. And you see, they don't really show up in the curve. Don't worry about the curve going down. It could just as well come out. But you see, there's no effect on this 10 times high voltage in the curve. But we can do better than that. We can use 50 times the voltage we normally use. And then you see, here comes the cell. You apply this pulse for a second. And you see the cell changes. And it slowly back up again. And you give another pulse, and it changes, and so on. And you clearly can see that the electrical field changes the cells. Now, there's one thing I want to say here, because people very often misunderstand that, is that cell phones, the, the field from cell phones, are much, much weaker than that. The cell phone cannot hurt you, except if you drive and talk at the cell phone at the same time. That's, that may be dangerous. But the electrical field from the cell phone is perfectly fine. And, and the United States, a lot of people in the United States is afraid of buying a house under a power line. But that's perfectly safe, because the electrical field from the power line is so small, it has no effect on people. So I, I recommend buying to people buying a house under a power line, because you get a very cheap house. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you're going to sell it, it's difficult to sell it. <laughs> You don't have to worry about that. But the electrical fields, which we normally encounter, has no effect on the human. So, but you can do even better than that. Here's a, here's a cell, and the current coming up from the cell normally goes around the cell. You can do electroporation. That means you apply a very high field, and the field then can puncture the cells. So you get little holes in the membrane. And in this holes in the membrane, molecule can diffuse into the cells, but normally doesn't go through the membrane. And so this is called electroporation. So an example of that, and you need roughly one volt across each membrane for this, for this to happen. So here is the, uh, before the shock, so here is the cell, and here we have the fluorescent molecule in the solution. Then you give the cells on the electrode a shock, and they fluor they've got all there, the fluorescent molecule, if things work, will diffuse in the cells, and they should make the cells light up. So let me see how the experiment looked like then. Here's a typical example. The unit pulse at 40 kilohertz, and you see here at, uh, you can't see it here, but this is 50 millisecond. You have a little bit, 100 millisecond, a little bit more. This is 150, I think this is 200 millisecond. You have all the cells light up because you have to fuse in the cell. And these cells are still alive. If you do this at 4 volt, it's even stronger. So this is called electroporation. You can electroporate things in the cell, and then you can continue studying the cell and see with the molecule you induce into the cell how it changes the cell behavior. Then we're going to go one step further, something we call wound healing. There's a migration assay. And normally when you do wound healing in tissue culture, you scrape, you have growing in one layer of cells, and you scrape it with a plastic protective. And then you look at this wound, if you want to call it that, there are no cells here, and you look at it in the microscope, and the cell will come crawling back in, and finally, the wound will heal. This is typical of how people do wound healing. But these pro this very problem with reproducibility and qualification, because it's difficult to do accurately. 
So we have then automated the whole healing, and this is, this is the MDCK cells here. Again, I showed you 1,500, 200, 500 milliseconds. And if you look at the last cell here, there are all of these cells here have been a death. They have been destroyed by the electrical field, and the electrical field is high enough and for a long time. So rather than doing this for 500 milliseconds, let's do it for five seconds, and then you will kill all the cells on the electrical. So you have really wounded them. And a typical example is here. Here are two controls, and here are two cells they have wounded. Here you apply the very high field, and then the resistance drops to the value, but you, but you have no cells on the electrode. And then the, the cell will, will then call back in and, and cover the electrode, and finally you have healed the wound. So this is completely automatic, and it's a much better way of doing wound healing than anything else. And this is an example here is our electrode. Here are the cells, and here is the still the wound left. You see these cells crawl in and heal the wound. And this is not a magic way of doing it. And it's very reproducible. If you look at this thing, here's a control. Here the wound, three electrodes. They crawl back up, we wound them again, and they come back up again. So it's a very reproducible, very simple thing to do. And not all of the customers like that very much. Finally, as a little more complicated, now we go look at single transduction. And if you have a cell, this is supposed to be a membrane of the cell, and you have a receptor, a ligand will bind to the receptor. And there's a single transduction, we have a second messenger, and that will affect the cellular responses and maybe changes the nucleus and whatnot. And we have worked here with something called the D protein coupled receptor. And, and so this is a thing in the membrane, and when it's when the, in the membrane, and the coupled receptor, so this is the D protein. And the, the second messenger is calcium in this case. So this is a typical example then. We have CHO cells. This is a name of a particular cell which have been engineered to overexpress muscarinic receptor. And we have the agonist with the carbocol. So here is the control, and you put different amount of carbocol in to get different responses. And it turns out that the people measure is the, is the EC50 is roughly one micromole of carbocol. So this is a typical example for the carbocol binding to the surface. Now, in addition to that, we have an antagonist, which is a molecule will also bind to the same receptor. The antagonist is called PCP in this case, and here now we apply PCP first and then carbocol. We can have no PCP, we get the regular response from carbocol. If you have a very, very low amount of PCP, we still get roughly the regular response. If you have a higher amount of PCP, the antagonist will bind to the receptor, and therefore the carbocol has no effect. So this is a teaching from biologists like to do. And, and so we are very happy that this works well in our system. So finally then, as the end of my story, the, if you are looking for what we like to do, we had an article with Nature in 1993, quite a long time ago now, and, and you could look that up. Actually, it would be better if you look me up on www.biophysics.com. Then you find out what I do in biophysics, it's easy to remember. So it's a web tag, but it's easy to remember. And it's only that name, the website Biophysics, the most valuable thing about my company. Four times people have asked to buy that domain that name from us, and we haven't sold it yet. <laughs> and so here then is the system we have which we try to sell. This is the ESIS incubator, and this is the system here. And I like to tell you this because we have this wonderful amplifier we use, which is a fancy voltmeter. And physicists like this very much because it has lights and buttons, I call it buttons, blinking lights and everything. And we tried to sell this to the biologists. But then a friend of mine came in and said, this is ridiculous, you can't do that, so we do have to change the system. <laughs> now we have the amplifier built into this box here. And I don't like that, but he's a better salesman than I am. And the box has only one button, it says on and off. <laughs> so this is a good way to do it. So this 
So this is the end of my story. Finally, then I would say that, uh, that uh, to show you that I'm also salesman, the price of this system is roughly thirty-six thousand dollars. But if any of you come up and buy an instrument before I go out that door, you get ten percent off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for Dr. Gaylor's uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we still have enough time, so actually we can entertain uh, quite a few questions from the audiences. Uh, please. Bonjour, Monsieur Dr. Dyper. I'm a graduate student from mechanical engineering. Um, you get the direct evidence of the existence of the edge gap in superconductor at 31 years old and the one that on bear price at 44 years old. Why you transfer to study biophysics at uh, 48 years old? The one year at Cambridge seems like very important to your career in area. So, or just also move emotionally from sharing us work for what is like. Uh, well, I understood the question. You want to know why I moved away from yes. physics to biology. Yes. And uh, I don't know. You don't want to know why I moved away from mechanical engineering to physics. <laughs> <laughs> Because I moved several times. And, uh, actually, I will talk about superconductivity this afternoon and how I got to do that. So I moved away from mechanical engineering to superconductivity. The reason I moved away to biophysics was that I had a sabbatical from General Electric. I worked for General Electric at the time, and I spent a year in Cambridge, England. And when I came to Cambridge, England, I was going to continue doing tunneling experiments. But it turned out that the equipment we had at General Electric was so much better than the equipment in Cambridge, England, I recognized that would be not a good idea to do that. So while I spent the year in England, I studied biophysics. And uh, I, because biology then, that was just after the DNA, the structure of DNA had been discovered, and it was clear to me that biology is going to be the field for the future. And biology is it's very important. And it's very important, I think, for physicists, in the way I read the biology, I'm not really a biologist, but I've gone into biology and trying to develop equipment like the thesis system I showed you here, and other equipment which then biology can use. And I think the physicists can play a vital role in biology by, by doing these kinds of things. And I thought that was much more exciting to me than doing physics. And the big excitement which is left in physics, as you may or may not know, are fundamental particles. But to work on fundamental particles, either you have to be a very, very strong theory, or you have to work in a team with 500 other, 500 other people working on big accelerators and things. And then six years later, you may or may not get an answer to what you tried to find out. <laughs> and I like to get the answer tomorrow. So that's why I'm going to do So that's the reason. Uh, in the measurement of all your samples, yes. did you did it in room temperature or not? The, the temperature? Room, room temperature. Room temperature. Room temperature? No. Only, excuse me, the, the I should not mention that. The people who grow cells have this incubator. And the reason they have the incubator is that they heat, they heat up the cells to 37 degrees centigrade. I, I, I don't know, do you use centigrade in Taiwan or you would find that? Yeah, so 37 degrees centigrade because that's the normal temperature your cell likes to grow at. And also what they have in the incubator, they have a carbon dioxide atmosphere. <laughs> because this is this is the natural way of of, of, of uh, keeping the pH at seven, roughly at pH seven, but the cell like to be at. So that's why most people grow cells in an incubator with the pH control. You don't have to do that. You can grow cells actually with a different medium. You don't need the carbon dioxide, 
and you know, me and me and the baby can grow cells at room temperature, but then they grow much slower. What I also didn't say is that the, the fish cells I grow in Norway, they are grown at 15 degree temperature, because the salmon lives at that kind of temperature, and the cell grow best at that temperature. And the very interesting thing is that if you heat up that experiment to like 22 degrees, the virus can no longer attack the cells. So the virus is ineffective if you drop it up at 22 degrees centigrade. But it's too expensive to heat up the ocean to 22 degrees. <laughs> so we have to deal with the way it is. And uh, for your measurement of the surface incidence, uh, do you consider different surface properties? For example, if you modify the surface, does the behavior of the, uh, the, the cell change or not? If, uh, you ask if the behavior of the cell changes when I measure it? Uh, when you change the surface properties? No, I don't, no, I don't think we do. We, we assume that the surfaces are similar whether the cells are there or not. And that's an assumption we use when you do the figure. So we say when you have, you can measure the electrode without cells, and you measure the electrode with cells, and we say the surface property does not change. And uh, this is really an assumption, but I think that assumption is true, and the theory we have shows up that everything works very well anyway with that assumption. So the electrical field does not change the surface property. As long as you keep see the, 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 when we deal with the cells on the electron, we have only a few millivolts voltage drop from the, from the electron to the solution. And a few millivolts doesn't change anything. And if you go up to, when you electroporate the cells and kill it, then you have a few volts on the cells. And then, of course, you will make hydrogen and all sorts of bad things happen. So that maybe not the electrical field that kills the cell, maybe it's really the hydrogen. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the compare electron device, the, the, the bar system seems a health system. So how can you simplify or uh, purify the signal you measure? I mean, how can you so get a high uh, precision to predict what happens in your sample? Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure you ask how I can purify the signal. Yeah. See, see what we have, we, the amplifier with all the blinking light is a lock-in amplifier. And a lock-in amplifier is a special kind of amplifier which only detects the signals at certain frequencies. And so that's a very good amplifier. And I have no doubt that what we measure is the real changes and not something else, not noise. And so we, if you're not familiar with a lock-in amplifier, I, I recommend you look at that because it's a very, very useful thing, particularly in physical measurements. Hi, Dr. Taylor. First of all, thank you for your talk. It was very enjoyable. And um, also the Pepperson dog was a very good salesman. <laughs> I have two questions, actually. The one is about the theory of the biosensor. Um, I believe that in one of your experiments, you showed that uh, by adding some damaging drug, uh, you see a decrease in the impedance of the drug. I'm just wondering, uh, the decrease in impedance, is it because uh, when the cell dies, it detaches from the electrode? Or does the cell remain attached to the electrode, but the properties change? Uh, I'm just not sure about this. OK, the reason is when you, when you kill the cells okay. with, a, with a virus, they will still remain on the electrode. Okay. But they will be loose, so they come up from the surface. And that's why the resistance get back to the original with no cells. But it actually do not, they're actually not removed from the electrode, they will still be there. Okay, and uh, my second question is, um, you mentioned that when you see uh, decreasing impedance, it, uh, it indicates that there's a change in sound morphology. Yes. Uh, can, is it possible to just by looking at the graph, but just by looking at the changes of the curves, is it possible to predict what particular kind of uh, changes it occurs to the cell? I mean, a particular kind of cell changes. 
Well, we, what we can do, because I didn't go into detail, we have a theory. And what the theory can do is can tell you the difference for the cells apart. That's an interior function. They can distinguish between the cell coming apart or the cell going closer or further away from the electrodes. That we can distinguish. When we say morphology changes, biologists start to look at the actual shape of the cell. We can't see that. We can only see the changes from these two parameters. But that's normally what people like to know. Right? And so the good thing that we, what we can do, since we have a measurement, we can tell other people what we measure. The biologists, when they look at the cell, they have to describe what they see, which is much, much more difficult. So, so I think this is a good way of doing that. I first welcome you to Tsinghua after so many years in Mr. Yuna and in her too. And uh, I, my question is, you first spent so many years as an industrial scientist in, at GE, and then you moved to university as academics. Now you're a salesman. And you seem to be doing remarkably well in all three different disciplines. That means you're going to buy an instrument. <laughs> I will sign a check. But if there's anything you want to tell young men and women in this audience, what's the most important attribute to be, you know, doing so well in all such a different areas? Besides being a Norwegian. Well, I don't know. It's a, that's a very difficult thing, young, but I can try to do as best as I can. Is that when I got to GE, uh, a good friend of mine now, John Fisher, was my mentor. He was a wonderful mentor. First of all, he said that, first of all, what he said, which I remember very well, he said that don't be afraid of giving other people credit. A lot of people try to hide, you know, somebody done something before, they don't want to give them credit. Give people credit they deserve. They would like you for it, and then do you like you, and that's one thing you should do with your science. The other thing John Fisher told me is that I, I, when I was, I was roughly 30 years old when I came to General Electric Lab as a mechanical engineer. And uh, he said, why do you want to work here? And I said, I want to learn some physics. But I said, uh, I know I'm too old. I'm 30 years old, and most physicists do their important work when they're in the 20s or something. At least in the past, they did that. So I said, I know I'm too old to do anything significant in physics. I just want to learn. And John said to me, that is not the way it is, he said. When you learn new things, you're afraid of them. So it doesn't make any difference what you age you are. When you learn new things, you're afraid of them. And he said, I would advise you to change your field every five to ten years. You can continue learning new things. And that's what I'm trying to do. And, uh, <laughs> If I had been religious, I thought I would be going to be a priest in my next <laughs> <laughs> But I'm not. So, but, so I, I'll switch the field. I have enjoyed that. I learned a lot of new things. It's a tough thing to do sometimes because you have, when, you have, when you have done something in one field, you know the people there, you go to meetings, you meet your friends. When you suddenly become a biologist, you go to different meetings, you don't know anybody, they don't know who you are, and it's a difficult thing to do. But I think it's been lots of fun. And I've also been into business school at RPI, and I taught a couple of courses at the business school to find out how these people think and behave. And I have enjoyed that. So, actually, when you get old, you love giving advice, right? You never stop. <laughs> but let me also say, my children, when they grow up, they say, they're really worried about what are they going to do when they grow up? What field are they going to enter? And my answer, don't be so worried about that. Because you can always change things. And you've got to be typical of the future to have much more change than they had in the past. And the only advice I can give, you should study physics and mathematics when you're young. Because when you get 50 years old, it's too tough to study mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> but you can always study history, for example, when you get 50 years old. There are a lot of examples of that. Very, very few examples of people becoming mathematicians in their old age. I hope that answers your question. For example, we can have a few 
produced uh, fluorescent molecules with high molecular weight, for example, an electrical weight of 200 or something. And, and so that works very well. So you can do, you can do, and also a uh, friend, one of our customers had an electric weight of the, the green monkey gene into the cell and have it expressed. So anything we have tried to do works very well, but I don't quite understand how, how to define efficiency. You know, we haven't really worried too much about that. Anyway. Uh, may I ask you a uh, continuous problem about the surface properties? Uh, because the, the soil absorbed on the surface, for example, if you use a metal, metal electrode, and uh, different metals may have different <coughs> effects to absorb the soil. And uh, do you think that that ever played a role in your in your instrument or in your study, or for example, you uh, modify the surface to enhance the absorption or maybe anchor points? Uh, as I understand, you're saying that things will absorb on the surface. The, the point is that when you do cells in tissue culture, you always have a protein layer absorbed on the surface before. The cells attach. If you be very, if you are very careful and introduce cells without the protein at all, you can do that by watching the cells carefully. The cells which fiscally absorb on the surface flatten out like a fried egg and die. They will not survive under those circumstances. And so, in normal tissue culture medium, you always have protein on the surface and the cell attaches to the protein. And I showed you one example here where we purposely have put different proteins first. And the cells, it is well known in this area that fibronectin is the protein the cell likes to absorb to. And the cells have actually specific receptors for the fibronectin protein that they attach to. And so these things have been worked out in great detail. Not by me, but our experiments prove, you know, confirm what other people have worked out. Uh, thank you, Dr. Geiger. I'm also a graduate student um, from other school. And uh, I have a question about the instrument. Because we can see this instrument is very sensitive for the current change or electrical change. And could be able this instrument combined with a microscope to observe the cell morphology at the same time for the experiment? Yes, we are actually just in the process of, actually I had a student in Norway who did this the hard way and she, she looked at the impedance and she took movies of the cells at the same time and compared the cell shape with the movies. And now, the, now the, we have, in the company, we're introducing a stage for the microscope where you can look at the electrode in the microscope while you're doing it electrically. We haven't sold that yet, but we're just getting that now. And uh, if you want to order that, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be fine. A good price. Thank you. I would like to appreciate your talk. Uh, just out of uh, curious, about you having to use your assistant to uh, the cell infect the virus. And uh, I'm just want to know, if the cell infects the bacteria, could you use your system? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. Uh, I mean, I just saw the, the your system is used to identify cell infected with virus. Um, I, I want to know the cell, the system will be used to uh, the, the cell infect the bacteria or something. Yes, you, 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 could, you could easily do that, actually. But what the best way to try to do is keeping bacteria away from the cells. But if you're interested in how bacteria affect the cells, you definitely could do that. And the bacteria, but bacteria is one problem you have in tissue culture and also fungus. Sometimes you, you, you know, inadvertently, because you have to work in sterile environment, but inadvertently, particularly a new undergraduate student, get fungus into the system. And, and that will also kill the cells, you know. So you, 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 could, you could actually make a study of that if, if that's what you wanted. We haven't done that though. As I said in the very beginning, I tried to, there's something called bacterial films, which you can get through on the electrode. And I tried to ex, you know, expand the system so I can look at bacterial films, but I haven't been able to do that at the present time. Hopefully 
next year in Norway, I will branch up. I do use a gold filling you experiment to attach a cell. The reason, the reason for that is that the gold film does not have a, a, a uh, oxide in it. If you, for example, you have used other films, then violence is shorter with that. For example, lead films work very well. But people think that lead kills uh, cells, but it doesn't really do that when you have solid lead. But the, the important thing about gold, there are two important things. One is that gold does not react with anything or practically anything. So there's a clean surface of gold. It doesn't change sitting in a tissue culture medium. Secondly, if you make gold film thin enough, which means maybe like 50 nanometers or so, you can see for gold with a microscope. So there are two important facts. You can see for it, and it doesn't form an oxygen. We could use platinum, for example, but platinum is not transparent. So that wouldn't be good. It would be very good, but we don't know how to do that. There's something called indium oxide, which is completely transparent oxide, which conduct, but we don't know how to make that. So, you know, we could, you know, people could branch out to do that. Somebody chose to do that. What are the major uh, limitations of this uh, ESIS system? The limitations? Yes. The price. <laughs> <laughs> Answer, yeah. If I could sell it for four thousand dollars, I would be going by cupcakes. The, the the problem: our customers are normally professors in the United States, and professors don't have their own money. They have to apply to the government or to some industry to get support for their work. A large number of professors like our instrument, but they have to apply to National Institute of Health. And to begin with, that was very difficult because nationally, the people who reviewed the proposals didn't recognize the importance of the system. So it was difficult to get money. So basically, even though professors are over customers, they really get their money from the government. So really, and it's sort of like the government who sell these things to them. So, so and the, the fact is that it is difficult, everybody has difficulty raising money for research, and a large amount of money spent forty thousand dollars for an instrument. You know, you could that that's roughly what a graduate student costs in the United States. So they have a choice of having a student working for you for one year or buying one of my instruments. How many set up uh, so far has been solved worldwide? <laughs> uh, this is a trade secret. <laughs> Actually, I didn't say anything about that. We have uh, sold roughly a hundred instruments, and uh, all over the world. And uh, there's actually one here in, in uh, yeah, yeah. So and uh, and uh, we have now, I said, sixty thousand, forty thousand dollars. But we now have a new instrument which we call an educational system, which costs as little as five thousand dollars. That's very limited. It's meant to, we really don't make any money on that. But it's meant to be used in biological labs. And so it is, we hope that when the professors buy this and use it in a lab for the students, when the students graduate, they want to use the real thing, you know, coming by every system. So it's a, it's a, it's a business strategy, if you will. And so the cheapest instrument they have now is $5,000. And the most expensive one is forty thousand dollars. We have some instrument in between. Thank you, Professor. Yes, uh, thank you for the great talk. And uh, I'm glad that you give this talk uh, in this department. This department is biomedical engineering and environmental sciences. So this is exactly what we are doing here. And now I'd like to uh, ask a question about education. As you mentioned earlier. People should learn physics and mathematics yeah, when they were young. Um, now, the life science research uh, put more emphasis on molecular level. And so, uh, in biomedical engineering education, uh, corresponding to this change, actually, we try to teach our students in undergraduate uh, um, physics, mathematics, chemistry, and uh, some basic biology. Uh, could you make some comment on this uh, educational strategy? The educational strategy? Yeah. 
Well, I can tell you how things are. I worked for General Electric for 30 years, and I know things, how things are in the United States. Is that the, for an engineer, as it may not be fair, but it's the way it is. For an engineer, it's good to be an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, or a chemical engineer. It's not good to be, say, a biomedical engineer, even though this may be unfair, but places like General Electric think we want to have a guy who knows some basic thing. If he's going to do a medical thing, we can teach them that. General Electric I mean, could teach them that. So, so I think the best way as an undergraduate to take a pure field, like, say, physics or, or, or chemistry or something, and as a graduate student, if you want to do biophysics, that's perfectly fine. But not as an undergraduate. This is to say. And the other thing, I also gave all my kids and I advice, and I upset somebody here saying this, but I'll do it anyway, is that in the United States, if you study physics, for example, and don't go on to graduate school, if you get a job at General Electric, you will be a technician. If you study electrical engineering and don't go to graduate school and work for the electric, you're a professional. So physics or chemists are not recognized as professional people. If you study chemistry, say, and work for the electric for an undergraduate degree, you're a technician. If you study chemical engineering, the same number of years for the general electric, you're a professional. So you just, you know, I'm not trying to discourage people from studying physics and chemistry. If you do that in the United States, you should really then go all the way. Yeah, uh, I agree part of what you said, and, uh, but uh, because we are biomedical engineers, so I have to say something different. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, we have such as you said, that's why in our education, what we exactly did is uh, we have uh, three major physics, biology, or chemistry. They can choose either one or another, but we did not teach as much as physics they did in physics department. Instead of uh, doing all physics, we teach most of physics, but we also save some time for them to learn some basic biology and the basic chemistry, like organic chemistry and biochemistry. And then besides, so for physics, they can have all uh, main uh, core course of physics, but we also give them some uh, basic chemistry and the basic uh, biology. For students, if they choose a major in chemistry, they will have a core course of what they have in the power of chemistry, but they will learn some basic uh, physics, like electronics or electronic medicine and some basic biology. That's what we are doing here. We appreciate very much uh, Dr. Gaver's uh, presentation this morning. And honestly, I learned from this uh, presentation uh, the most, most is uh, to learn every day and uh, don't be afraid of uh, changing field every five, ten years. So I definitely will learn uh, from this. Thank you very much.